Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Coffee with Casey. Take 30 minutes out of our week. And look, you know, if we look at the market, and I feel like I'm the guy in the crow's nest on the Titanic or something, you know, I'm always looking for icebergs, you know. Um, when, you, when you've been through the cycles of real estate where the market goes up and then the market crashes and the market goes up and the market crashes. So at the beginning of this year, we had a show and it was um, entitled The Perfect Storm, where we had lower interest rates, our inventory was down, um, you know, demand was up. Uh, it looked like we were getting our vaccines, which worked, thank God. Um, and the market was returning to, to some normalcy. Also, in the outer lying suburbs, I felt that they were going to get more of a punch than uh, the closer you get into the city because now everybody's on Zoom. A lot of people are working from their home. Uh, they want more house. They're not tethered to their employment centers. So now they can move from Arlington to Percyville. And instead of living in a condo, they can live in a big house. So, you know, and, and basically that is what happened, right? So, so it's been crazy what's happened this year. I'm gonna show you some numbers right now that are just freaking off the chart. Um, I don't know that everybody's experiencing it, but I'm gonna show you what, what our experience has been. Um, so, so that has happened now. The reason why I do this show every Thursday is because I am the guy in the crow's nest and I'm looking for the iceberg and the iceberg is high interest rates and more, more inventory. So when the inventory climbs and instead of competing with one house or two houses, you're competing with 12 or 15 houses, that's when trouble happens. When interest rates go up, initially the buying is, is fast and furious because everybody's trying to get in there and lock in rates and get a house. So, so that actually stimulates the market initially when interest rates are moving up. So, but eventually the cost of borrowing money drives down the amount of house you can buy. And that uh, eventually leads to an adjustment in pricing. Okay. So, so I'm keeping an eye out for uh, any inventory influx. How big is it? Uh, some people say it's going up. 10% a month and blah, blah, blah. So we'll take a look at it. And, and remember, um, as we're looking at markets, there are 11,000 markets in here, right? So I went to a market, I was looking at a market and I have a house that was gonna go on a market for $2 million. So I said, well, $2 million. Okay, so let's get a, let's get a, a you know, Vienna, Oakton, McLean. Let's look at the $2 million houses. So this month, nine went under contract in around that price range, nine went under contract and 11 withdrew unsold. So that's 45% of the market sold and 55% of the market did not sell. So there's some things we're gonna talk about today on why is that happening? Why is not everybody experiencing this big? I mean, look, uh, top 25 deals that we sold this year averaged $141,000 in profit or premium. Why did it happen? Is it normal? Is everybody getting all of that? So we'll take a look at that. Um, they did ask me to speak at a convention. I don't know if it's a realtor convention or what it is. I, I'll find out today um, on a panel of, you know, listing, you know, tips on listings and things like that. So, uh, you know, I don't even know where to begin on that. I mean, you know, we talk about so much in our listings and our pricing strategy and all of that. So I don't even know where to start. So maybe I'll get some tips today. Um, so let's start with the guy in the crow's nest looking for the iceberg. And the iceberg is listing inventory coming on the market. So let's take a look at that. Let me, let's whip on over to the old PowerPoint and we will get you up to speed. But a boom, but a boom. All right, let's take this live. All right, so this is the listing inventory. And what I do is I'm comparing it. I'm comparing it over the last three years, 2018, 19, and 20 with this year, right? So if we average the last three years, you can see our inventory is really going down, right? So these are homes that were listed, that had a list period of January 1 to you know October 30th, all right? So January 1 to October 30th, this is what happened in 218, 219, 220, and 221. So 
We are down in our listing inventory. So is the iceberg anywhere in sight? No, there is no iceberg in sight. So this is a big one. Then you have, this is the supply, right? So when supply goes down and demand goes up, prices go up, right? So here's a little look at what the demand looks like. So these are our sales for the first, uh, you know, 10 months of 2021 versus 18, 19, and 20. Okay. So you can see, um, you know, our sales are up 6% over their three year average. So sales are up 6%. Now, so what's the market that I'm comparing here? So, like I said, you got to have some market. This is a general market. So I said, give me a five mile radius from where I'm sitting. Um, just do the detached houses, which is what our market mostly is. So detached houses uh, within a five mile radius of Vienna. And this is what we have. Okay. Now, you know, I analyze every market when we go out there and burr, we're killing it because we've got that locked down because that's a special market. You know, every market is special, but in general, right this second, 6% of, uh, we're down 6% in the inventory and we're up 6% in um, sales. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the demand is very strong. It also tells you that, as I said before, um, we're not going on vacation this year and we're not gonna celebrate the holidays. We take one year off for Thanksgiving, one day off for Christmas, but the buyers aren't taking any time off. The sellers aren't taking any time off. So we're working through the holidays this year. All right, so, so that's the first thing we need to know, all right? Now, the next thing is, let's talk about some of these premiums that people are getting. So the, the, the topic for this show is the less you ask, the more you get, okay? Now, I'm not talking about a lot, you know, I'm gonna ask a lot less, but I'm talking about a little bit. I'm talking about going under major thresholds to get to capture buyer pools, right? So let's take a look at this. This is our top 25 listings uh, versus the rest of the market, okay? So over on the left, you see the days on market, okay? Over in here, you see days on market. And then you see the address and what city. So, so if these are our top 25, they're basically, you can see anywhere from Burke to Ashburn, Centerville, Chantilly, it doesn't matter where it is, Great Falls, it really doesn't matter. Here, you have the tax assessed value, you have the list price, you have the close price and you have the premium. In other words, the premium is what did somebody pay over list price? So I was asked this, I was asked today or yesterday, well, you know, you get a lot over your list price. Does that just mean you ask less? You know, you're, you're listing it too low. And so, you know, that's why not only do I bring in the premium that we got, but what is the percentage of the assessed value? Now, everybody has an assessment, which is right here. And the question is, what is the close price in relationship to the tax assessed value? And then compare ours to the rest of the market, okay? So if you come down here, you see our days on market was four days on market. And again, if you've listened to the show, you know I'm a big advocate. We're gonna get the biggest price, the best terms, uh, you know, no appraisals, no uh, home inspections in that first week. So I'm a big advocate. So the top 25 sales all came in that first week, okay? The average for the market, if you look at a 10 mile radius of where I sit, you know, and I said, just give me everything from a million to a million four, because look, my average is 1.2 million of list price. So I said, give me every house that was listed between a million and a million four, and let's see what they look like, okay? So our average assessment was 132,000. Theirs was 115. We put it on for a one, 0.202, obviously I didn't put it on for that. You would put it on for less, okay? But that's the average. So you can see my list price is all ducked under major pricing thresholds. You won't see like a 960 because buyers are looking at 900, 950, one, 1 million. So I always tuck it under a major threshold, right? That's one of the keys. So let, let's look at this house. This house was listed, I think for 2.4 million wasn't worth 2.4 million. It was worth about 2 million, maybe 2 million 50,000. So I tucked it under 2 million and Billy sold it for 2.15 million. So 
you know, we are staying under major thresholds, which is a real part of our strategy, okay? Not a ton, because you can see this is their assessed value, that's their list prices. So not a ton, we're not, you know, we're not 100,000 under where we should be, but sometimes it's 25 or 30 or 40, you know, thousand less than we could be. So let's look at the average sales price was 1.351, the average list price 1.2. So what does that tell you? We sold for about 141,000 over, right? That's our premium. That's your premium of all these. Look, I have homes that sold for 100,000 over list price and didn't make the top 25, okay? So, so there's your winners, right? Now I can tell you that the common denominator between all these sellers was they all wanted more money than I said you need to list for. Every one of them, not one of these people that listed here were hoping for, well, maybe, yeah. Okay, Flint Hill was hoping for 1.4 million. You got 1.645. Okay, you got me on that one. But most of these, you know, they were hoping for a million dollars. They got a million 125. They were hoping for 1.35, they got 1.477. Now this follows a common theme, which is the less you list it for, the more you get, right? So uh, Montfort, they wanted 1.55 million, right? So I said, you you know, there's no market at that market. We've tested it. You got to get in on 1.5 and they got 1.651, okay? So you really, to a, to a person, this, this house right here, we tested it at 145, there was no market. So in the coming soon period in our predictive analysis, we tested 145, that's what they wanted. I went back to that seller and I said, look, there's no market here, nobody's favoring it, nobody's really coming in, we cannot predict any contracts are coming in at 145. So we must drop it to 14, so we did. To their credit, to all of these sellers credit, they, they had faith that what, you know, our predictive analysis was working. So we dropped it to 1.4. We have one contract, one, okay? And they came in at 1.4. Excuse the banging. We're getting flooring put in upstairs. So I'm going to have to talk over the banging. We have one contract for 1.4 million. And the agent, again, we, in, uh, you know, we, not interrogate, but we question the agent to get as much information as we can before we decide on our contracts. So the agent said they had lost six contracts already. So we said, okay, we need your highest and best offer, no escalation clauses, highest and best offer. Again, another secret of our strategy. There are none of the top 10 agents in Vienna that ask for highest and best offer. They all allow escalation clauses. Had had this deal, had this transaction right here allowed an escalation clause, the sellers would have got 1.4 million. Instead, we said, no, you must bring in your highest and best offer Monday by noon, within a half hour, they came in at 1.55 uh, million and no home inspection and no appraisal. So that seller, by going back to 1.4 instead of 1.45, by going back and listening to us and by our negotiation strategy, they made $150,000. Now, $150,000 is a ton of money. That's a lot of money, right? Even for people that have a lot of money, that's a lot of money, right? So, so in this case, yes, they went backwards and they got this. So, so you know, I, I say this to sellers when they come out in the market that the only thing you can do wrong is overprice your house and miss the buyer pool. And again, I'm not talking about um, $100,000. I'm talking most of the time, $20,000, $30,000 drop, okay? I know you want this, but if you just get where that buyer pool is, it'll propel you way over what you were asking for. And this strategy has worked time and time again. So if we go back down here to the bottom, we say, okay, um, you know, we asked about 1.2, we got about 1.35, you know, our, our premiums, 141,900. And our percentage of assessment, which is a big deal, this is the one that shows that we are not asking too much and that's what's hurting. 
percentage of assessment is your sales price to buy as a percentage of your assessed value. We all have an assessed value. The sales price versus the assessed value. So we're getting 132% on average of our assessed values, right? The rest of the market, right? Down here, the rest of the market listed for 1.25 or whatever. They got 127. Their premium is $22,000. And their percentage of assessment is 121%. So if we're getting 132% of assessment, Similar size houses, similar size assessments, but for some reason, we're getting 10%, 11% higher, which is equating to $120,000 more than the average realtor is getting or the average for the rest of the market. So for people that are watching, and again, this is not bragging, this is just facts. And the reason why I'm saying this is you know, it's not bragging because there are people out there that are making big mistakes with pricing, negotiating strategy, how they make their house look, what they do to sell their house in this market. This is the average 10 mile radius, homes between a hundred, a million and a million four. So same size, same average assessment. But you know, if you look down here and I was pretty surprised myself when I looked at this, I said, well, you know, I'm not asking that much less than the competitors are. It's only maybe if you if you compare this, okay, so I'm about 15, 20 percent, uh, twenty thousand dollars assessed higher, and I'm a little bit lower on the price. So it's not a ton. It's a slight adjustment to find the buyer pool. In most cases, it's thirty thousand bucks. According to this, it's thirty thousand dollars. So I had that, you know, when I was talking with the seller, he said what I'm sure the agent that he's spoken to, four or five agents, would say, and that is, well, they're over underpricing the house. That's how they get that money. No, no, it's really not. It's not underpricing the house. So the key to this market, let me let me escape from this. And I'll get us back to uh, I'll get us back to some nose to nose time. Let me stop sharing here. Ah. Ah. I hate this man. Program really freaks me out when you when you PowerPoint when you're doing Zoom. But so I, I guess you know. The point is, what is it? Then, then why is it that these houses are going for so much more? Um, you know, and to be honest with you, I, I'm more than willing to talk about it, you know, on Coffee with Casey with everybody and share it with sellers. Because I think my sellers, you know, look at this and look at this before we talk. And, and this helps them make their decision that, Yes, we're not listing it too low. This is what, this is the strategy. The strategy works. The strategy has got 11% more, um, you know, than the rest of the market. So, you know, yes, I get it. So that's that's the reason I put that out there, not 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 for the bragging part of it. But I start thinking about that. And it's, it's not just the pricing. I mean, um, you know, again, the theory of this show is the less you ask, the more you get. And, and that is true, okay? Because... We are finding that buyer pool, but how do you find the buyer pool? So the first thing that we do is, you know, Kelly or Morgan or Colby or Pat or Billy will come out and Pam will come out and they'll look at the house with me and we'll all look at it, but I really rely on them. Um, you know, I can walk into a house and say, that house looks great to me. And Kelly will say, no, that's set up for a 60 something, right? 60 something not set up for a 30 something. So what they do is they'll take out a, 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 a kitchen light here, a, you know, dining room uh, chandelier there. They'll replace things, they'll put carpets, they'll do some paint. You know, they make it look like it's a 30 something or 40 something house. So, so that is 
clear part of it. And, and you know what, I, I, I've shown this before, but I was looking online. I'm going to take you back. I'm going to take you back and share a screen. One more time. I got to show you something. Again, I'm not crazy about, um, I'm not crazy about going back to PowerPoint. Because you know, it gets, sometimes I get, um, can't find something. Let me just show you something here. Let's go to some pictures. You know, you want to, you want to talk about, um, you know, what elements, what are, what are the, what are the real key elements of why we get more? Well, you know, the people don't live down the street from you. They live in Arlington and Alexandria and, and DC, and they live in, in, uh, Oregon and California and, and Connecticut. I mean, they're coming into town. So, this is a real key. This is a $2 million house. And I want you to look at the floor and I want you to look at the window. And that's what one of the big agents around here had it listed as. That's what it looked like. That's what we looked at, like. You bring in a modern carpet to break up the floors. You use Flamian photography so that the windows are screaming at you, right? And now you can see, when I'm looking in my dining room, I look, see this beautiful green as opposed to that. That's terrible, that's, that's awful. Now this was, again, major agent from Long and Foster in here. And, and you know, you can look at the floors and the windows. And that's what ours looks like, right? So it's not just the pricing, it's the marketing. This I saw, um, I saw an agent advertising this online and I looked at it and went, oh, that looks awful. Look at the, See what happens is they use flash photography. And when you use flash photography, that's what it does to the windows. If you use Flamian photography, that's what the windows look like. So they almost look at the windows compared to that painting, right? So do you wanna look out at that in the backyard or do you wanna look out at this? So it's just, it's a function of detail and the pictures are a part of this process, right? So I just wanted to show you, you know, that's kind of one, uh, one aspect of, that's one aspect of why are you getting an 11% premium? Because when we take that sucker out online and we get those pictures and we stage it the way we want it, get your pictures and get out, that's powerful. Um, you know, Mike Briggs, um, you know, and I were talking yesterday, uh, um, uh, someone wants to get into photography and, you know, start doing it. It's a passion of his. So I said, well, if you're going to do it, you need to investigate this kind of photography instead of that kind of photography. Now, again, I don't see a lot of people using it. It's a West Coast technique. I don't see a lot of it going on around here, not in the major uh, studios. But but this is this is future stuff. This is where you got to go. If you're going to take a picture of a house and the person's going to see it online, you must A, have the presentation correctly, like we do with our websites, and B, you need to have pictures like that. So, you know, the first thing we can talk about on that uh, realtor group is pricing, you know? The second is, well, fix the house up correctly. And, and I know, you, you know, a realtor doesn't want to tell us all of that because he's asking for their business, but he doesn't want to say, hey, your house looks like a 60 something house, we have to make it look like a 30 something house. You know, Morgan really came in and was a game changer when Morgan said, look, um, you know, all the buyers want transitional instead of traditional. And this home looks traditional. We got to make it more transitional. That's a lot better than saying, hey, your house is dated and it looks old. So, so it really helped when Morgan came in, we really started building the house the way we wanted to in that transitional, in that transitional stage. The pictures, obviously game changers. The websites, game changers, but then the game changer is this, and this has become much more, you know, you look at it and go, well, what's the key of getting that 11%? How are you getting 11% more for your houses? And I'm going to tell you how, okay? So we do all that work. We do the pricing. Uh, 
the buyer for a house in Oakton at $2 million is in McLean. He's looking at McLean. He lives in DC, Alexander Arlington. He's looking at McLean. He's not looking at Oakton, but he can't find the space feature and function he's looking for in McLean. So if you had a technique where your algorithms could find somebody looking for a $2 million house in McLean and take our presentation of our $2 million home in Oakton and display it to them, that'd be pretty good, right? So that's what we do. So I'm always looking for, if I'm in, McLe if I'm in Vienna, then who, you know, where are we next in the food chain? You know, McLean's prices are here, DC's prices are here, Vienna's prices are here. So if I'm in Vienna, I'm looking to McLean in DC. If I'm in Oakton, I'm looking at Vienna, McLean in DC. So the food chain is you've got to find the buyers when they go on and say, let me see all the $1.6 million houses in, in McLean. Guy in New York did that. I had a house. Nobody in Vienna wanted it. Beautiful house. Guy was sitting in his penthouse in New York. Um, he was looking for houses in McLean. Uh, our system knew it. And our, whatever Julie does, took our ad, put it in his Wall Street Journal feed. He fell in love with it. He got on a plane, he came down here and he bought it. That's how you get the value for the properties. So it's, it's not one thing, it's everything. It's kind of like football, you know, we coach football. Well, you can't just pass. You can't just run. You can't just, you know, run wide or run with power or dive. Or you got to do it all. I mean, you have to do everything. And you can't just have a great offense. You got to have a great defense. And you got to be able to stop the run and stop the pass. And, you know, it's, it's a common, it's everything. It's not one thing. It's everything, right? So when you market, how do we get that 11%? Okay, well, find people that are looking for houses somewhere else. The guy that we found for um, um, Flint Hill, L.A. He's in L.A. He's looking for houses in McLean. And we threw the house at him. He bid 150000 over the next closest bid. He bid 150000 higher than the, the next closest bid. And his remark to me was, do you have any idea what you get for $1.6 million in, in L.A.? This is a deal. He's looking in McLean. We found him. We sent him the ad. He bought that house. So, you know, so is it, it's the marketing too, right? It's the marketing, right? And then, um, so once you get them all excited and get everybody up, now, now the piece of resistance is the contract negotiation, right? I've told you all again, if you're a realtor, I told you, follow Chris Voss as an FBI negotiator, a hostage negotiator. He does it for business. It's great. You can interrogate people. You can get all this information on them. And then the finale is, give me your highest and best offer. I don't want any escalation clause. Highest and best offer, just bid it up, right? So when you have a large buyer pool that's interested and seven or eight people that want to buy that house, then you're going to find one from an area that's looking in McLean or from LA or from DC where these prices are nothing to them. And before you know it, boom. That's how you do it. So I don't know how, I don't know what part of any of that I would say at the real estate convention when I talk to them. Um, it is a combination of all of it, right? You can't do some things right. You got to do everything right. Kind of a Marine Corps mentality. Everything's got to be perfect. Everything's got to be right. Uh, we're very analytical in the way we do things. But, um, you know, I think the bottom line is, um, it's an incredible year. Is it an incredible year for everybody? No. If the average home that's listed for 1.2 million sells for 1.227, that is not really a great market. Well, then why the hell are ours selling for 141,000 over list price? So ours are selling for 1.351. There's a sell for 1.227. Similar assessments. Okay. So it's a combination of everything, guys. If you're, you know, as again, I talk to two people, I'm talking to realtors and I'm talking to the sellers. For the sellers, you know, everybody that wins just follows the same strategy that everybody else uses. And for the realtors, if you're not using any of these strategies, you need to start thinking about it. I can guarantee you if I walked into 
uh, you know, one of our offices or called one of the top producers, uh, you know, around and say, hey, uh, we're going to bring in a contract. Can we bring an escalation clause? They'd say yes. I have no idea why. I mean, I have no idea why. I mean, you would think if I ever run into a football coach who beats us, I'd figure out what he did and maybe copy it or, or take some of his stuff or ask him how he did it or how it, you know, I would say if I ran into an attorney that beat me, I'd hire that attorney. But if, if right now we're in the, you know, 55 to $60 million uh, range in Vienna and, and Oakton and others are at 10 or 12, then I'd start mimicking whatever the heck we were doing. Um, and one of it is, one of it is the no escalation clause. I mean, that's the simplest thing I can tell you is no escalation clause. So, so I'm up against it right now. We're at 31 minutes. So, so that's another edition of Coffee with Casey. I hope this helped. Hope it put together why if you ask less, you get more. Um, and what the proof, the proof is in the pudding, you know, and you don't have to ask for a lot less, just a little bit less. Just get in that major buyer pool and let the, let the show begin. Okay. Again, you can reach me at Casey at CaseySampson.com. If you want to know what your house is worth, you can text the address to me at 703-508-2535. That's my cell phone number. You can give me a call if you'd like. But if you want to know what your home is really worth, just give me a text, 703-508-2535. Again, we'll see you next week on Coffee with Casey. Bye, guys. Have a great week.